Shalom. Today we are continuing in our Hebrew alphabet, learning the letters two by two. If you haven't already gotten your font chart, there's a link below. You can click on it and it'll bring up a printable file. It's useful to have the paper while you're studying. The first letter we're going to cover today is the Mem. The Mem is pretty much at the center of the alphabet. You see it's a kind of like rounded like a mountain. It has a little flag on top and it has an opening at the bottom. The number value for mem is 40. The picture meaning is water. And it just sounds like mm. Our second letter is the resh. It's the third from the last letter. It's rounded in the back. The number value is 200. And the picture meaning is head. If you're familiar with the term, for example, rosh hashanah or rosh chodesh, you hear that rosh, it's the name of the letter resh, it means head. You will hear a lot of different pronunciations of this letter. The true Israeli resh is in the back of the throat, maybe like the French in the back. But there are so many Russians and Spanish speaking people that you will also hear a forward rolled R like the Spanish do. And of course, the English uh, kind of rounded tongue, R, R, as we say. I'm going to use an English pronunciation so it will be easy for you to hear. Before we go on, I just want to take some time to compare the resh to a letter you have already learned, which is the dalid. The difference is that the resh is rounded in the back, and you see these three examples on the right. The top font is a standard font. The middle font is a little more modern. The bottom font is the Torah scroll font. So these are rounded in the back. The Dalit always has a piece of the top that pushes back to the right. The top font is obviously the most difficult to distinguish between the two. And when they're next to each other, it's, it is easier. But you should take heart, even students that have been reading for a long time, and some of the more difficult to distinguish fonts still get these wrong, so don't worry about it. So the Mem and the Resh together make a word, which is Mar, which means bitter, in Genesis 24, 37. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. In Exodus 15:23, and when they came to Marah, why is it called? It's called something Mar. Why? They could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. In Numbers 5:18, and the priest shall set the woman before Jehovah, and uncover the woman's head, and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. So this is the trial for the spirit of jealousy to see if the woman really has been unfaithful. The water is made with dust from the floor of the tabernacle. And we're going to see later that this bitter has a kind of a medicinal quality to it. Here, from a medical point of view, we know that if the woman is pregnant, she will miscarry. In 1 Samuel 15, 32, Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. So we see that bitterness is associated with death. Here are some slightly different translations, and we get the idea more of what it means to be bitter. In 1 Samuel 22, 2, And every one that was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, that is David, and he became captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. So we have this idea of being discontented. In 2 Samuel 17, 8, for said Hushai, thou knowest thy father and his men, that they be mighty men, and they be chafed in their minds. This is a kind of old English phrase. The Young's literal translates it as bitter in soul. Comparing this feeling to a bear robbed of her whelps in the field, and thy father is a man of war and will not lodge with the people. 
So we can imagine a mama bear coming looking for her babies and she doesn't find them. Uh, all the emotions that she will be angry, she will be unsettled, she will be discontented, she will be bitter. Another word with the same root, uh, in fact, the resh is just doubled here, marar, and this is a bit common in Hebrew where the second and third letter will be the same, and the word still has the same meaning. For example, lev and levav, they both mean heart. So we see this here in Exodus 1.14. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field, all their service, wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. And again, another Mara name, Ruth, 120. And she said to them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, we are warned in Hebrews 12:15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. What happens when we are discontented, when we are bitter about something, if we continue to brood on it? It affects not only our internal life, it will manifest in your body as some kind of disease, but sometime you might be inclined to make a bad move. And so we see a related root, if we add the hey, mara means to rebel. In Numbers 20, verse 10, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? In Nehemiah 9.26, Nevertheless they were disobedient, and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets, which testified against them, to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocations. So here, the same root, rebel, is translated as disobedient. And we can see that the people are rebelling against uh, Yahweh's law. There's a different word, which is translated here specifically as rebelled. And this root is related. It is marad. So you see here the Resh and the Dalit are next to each other. You can see the difference. Now this root is contained within the name of somebody, and that is Nimrod. The nun you already know, so you know all the letters, you can read this word, Nimrod. And literally his name means, we will rebel. So it is written about this Mara, this, this kind of rebellion, in 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of Jehovah, he hath also rejected thee from being king. What happens when we rebel is we go into witchcraft, we, we are discontented, we don't have what we want, or we things are not the way we expect them to be. And so we engage in witchcraft to manipulate our circumstances and our situation so that we can have what we want, so things will be the way we think they ought to be. Bitterness will lead to rebellion, which will lead to witchcraft. Don't let any root of bitterness take place in your heart. Another word we see from this root is more, which is myrrh. Obviously, the English is taken directly from the Hebrew. In Exodus 30:23. Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even two hundred and fifty shekels, and of sweet calamus, two hundred and fifty shekels. So this is for making the anointing oil. It's a special oil. It has this myrrh in it. Song of Songs 3.6 Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh, and frankincense with all powders of the merchant. So we see that myrrh has a special pleasant odor. In Esther 2.12, Now when every maid's turn was come to go in to King Ahasuerus, 
after that she had been twelve months according to the manner of women, for so were the days of her purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of women. So it's a beauty treatment. Also in the New Testament, Matthew 2.11, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him with gifts, gold, because he is a king, frankincense, because he is a priest, and myrrh for his embalming. In Mark 15.23, And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. We see this as a kind of analgesic. And again in John 19.39, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Yeshua by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. So this is a special herbs that's used for the embalming process. So myrrh comes from a tree. The tree is pierced and the resin will drop down. It's used for perfume we've seen and for incense. It is an antiseptic which probably helps with the embalming. It is analgesic. That's why they put it in the to give to Yeshua on the cross. And it's also medicinal. So back some time ago, there was a concoction which was called bitters. It was a kind of a tonic where uh, maybe we would call it an infusion today or a tincture. It was alcohol-based, and the essence of different plants would come into the mixture. And as you can see, these bitters cured everything. I mean, biliousness and colds and coughs and debility and dyspepsia and rumors and humors, <laughs> no rumors, loss of strength and want of appetite. They were maybe, maybe some kind of snake oil, I'm not really sure, but this is what evolved into cocktails where an essence of something, a plant, some herbal plant would be diffused into uh, alcohol and they're, they're used to flavor current cocktails. But you notice they're called bitters. Coming into ancient Greece, myrrh was the chief export of the city of Smyrna, as we read in uh, the book of Revelation, the church that's at Smyrna. So the word Smyrna, the name actually comes from the myrrh, and you see Smyrna was a seaport, and so they were able to export many things. The word myrrh and in Greek, Smyrna becomes associated with any kind of ointment, any kind of salve. So we have two more cognates, marach, which means to apply a wound dressing, and marak, which means to scrub or scour. So the first we see, Isaiah 38, 21. For Isaiah had said, let them make a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster, that's marach upon the boil and he shall recover. So they're using it medicinally. It, it has a, a cognate word for putting the ointment on the wound. In Esther 2.3, And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Haggai, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things be for purification be given them. Again, a kind of antiseptic related idea. I know that the, that the modern Hebrew word marak means soup. Um, it's really not clear how it came from this to that, and maybe it's actually related to another word altogether. So what happens if you become bitter and you go into rebellion against God's laws and you turn your back and seek to do witchcraft, to decide what is best for yourself, you will wind up speaking and believing as this character in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven? Oh, Halal is the word in Hebrew, Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Five I wills. Are they against the five books of Moses? So here is our memory verse, Isaiah 50, verse 5. I'll read it, then I'll read it slowly and translate it, and then I'll read it again. Adonai Yehovah, patach li ozen, v'anochi lo mariti. Adonai, Lord, Yehovah, patach, he opened li, for me, ozen, ear. He opened my ear. V'anochi, and I, lo, did not, mariti, I did not rebel. When God opens our ears, we should listen and be obedient. Again, Adonai Yehovah, patach li ozen, v'anochi lo mariti. You now have 12 out of the 27 forms. We're getting close to being halfway there. I hope that you find this edifying. Till next time, tasim et ha'enayim al hashamayim. Keep your eye on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.